Prince and Winston University and the law school will take great pride. Our program will open with the singing of the national anthem. Please remain standing while our commencement choir sings the national anthem. They live in a mound underground, and they are 
very rowdy and absolutely fierce. Absolutely fierce. Almost absolutely fierce. That's kind of the point that I'll get to in a moment. In the course of the story, they defeat a giant kind of well sharp thing. These beans called drones, and just for those of you who are Harry Potter fans, they're kind of like the mentors, only maybe not so, not as frightening. And then the queens, the devil, dog, devil hounds from hell, which are indeed quite frightening, but they're not, not mock people, charge them gleefully. As I said, they're rowdy and most of the time fearless. The only thing, as it turns out, that they fear are lawyers. <laughs> only thing they fear are lawyers. Specifically in this tale, three lawyers conjured up by the witch. Excuse me, the queen. Now here's some of the dialogue that accompanies the presentation of these three lawyers to confront the not my people who have just defeated the devil hounds from hell, mind you. And this is Doc Willie. Ah, we are in real trouble new as the lawyers appear. Rob anybody who leads the clan. Oh, you're a hard woman, Queen, to set lawyers on us. An unnamed we three men. See the one on the left there? He's got a briefcase. It's a briefcase. Oh, Whaley, Whaley. Whaley is an exclamation of despair. And then back to Doc Whaley. The sound of doom when a lawyer snaps the clasp. That is, when the lawyer opens his or her briefcase. So these little warriors, their swords actually go blue only in the presence of warriors. That's the only thing in the world that they fear and they believe they are done for when the queen conjures up three of them. As it happens, they're saved by a lawyer. They actually had a lawyer in their midst the whole time and just didn't know it because he'd been turned into a toad by the fairy godmother in a contractual dispute. So this toad, who realizes in the midst of all this that he used to be a lawyer, steps forward and defends them and overcomes the three lawyers conjured up by the queen. We're all familiar with the phrase that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And there's, I think, a little lesson here that we, we freemend about this. These lawyers, in furtherance of the queen's interest, are exercising the power that they have, which is mighty, but in furtherance of a corrupt purpose. And they have to be saved by another lawyer who's going to use his power in furtherance of good to defend what we free men so that Tiffany can then rescue her brother. Now, I won't leave you with that vision of a lawyer. I don't think that would be sufficient or satisfactory that you walk out of here thinking of the lawyer's as toes, even though this was a very righteous toe who did a very good job, knew his craft. So let me pivot. About 15 years ago, I became aware of something that the American Film Institute does every year. They release a list of the 100 leading depictions of heroes in American film and the 100 leading depictions of villains in American film every year. And they rank one of them each and every year. Not for that year, but for all time. So this is the all-time list. And there's movement from year to year, but this is the all-time list. So again, I became aware of this 15 years ago. So. At the very top of the list this year is the all-time movie villain depicted in American film. And let's have a little audience participation here. Who do you think that might be? Anybody? No! No! Animal Lecter. Animal Lecter. You recall who Animal Lecter was in The Silence of the Lambs? A forensic psychiatrist who becomes a serial killer in a cannon. I think that's worthy of being up there at the top of the list. It used to be Darth Vader for a few years, but then Hannibal Lecter moved to the top. Now the counterpart in the number one hero slot of all time as depicted in American film, and again I'll invite the response here, is, yeah, we're with a bunch of lawyers, it's Atticus Finch. It is Atticus Finch from the Kill Now think of that for a moment. Think of that. Atticus Finch is to heroes what Hannibal Lecter is to villains. And why is that? It's not what we would normally consider to be superpowers there. Right? This is not Superman or some other superhero. It's just an ordinary person who happens to be a lawyer, 
who happens to be very competent, so is that wise at the top of this? Probably not. Quite compassionate. You see multiple depictions of that throughout the film. You recall, the gentleman comes to the back door to pay off his bill, I think in this instance with some chickens. And there's a dialogue between Atticus and his daughter, a scout, Jean Louise. He shows great compassion for his client, Tom Robinson. He shows compassion for the accuser. For the accuser. So certainly that's part of it. He's brave. He's incredibly brave. And we see multiple instances of this. If you'll recall, he goes to the jail and sits on the front porch because he knows there's a mob coming to lynch Tom Robinson, his client, a black man who's been accused of raping a white woman. And this is Mississippi in the 1950s. And he sits on that porch and reports that. Now, Scout actually helps because she shows up and she interjects another presence into this. But he was going to be there that night knowing that something dramatic and dangerous might happen. Of course, he took the case in the first instance, knowing that it was all but hopeless, knowing that no matter what he said, that jury was going to convict. But he took it out of a sense of duty, out of a commitment to justice, out of recognizing that every single person deserves an attorney. He was going to be Tom Robinson's attorney. So he was, for all those reasons combined, a hero, and that's what's recognized on this list. And the list is kind of meaningless at this point, right? It's just all about the character that's depicted there. The character in the profession that you are now joining, the character who was going to give his voice to someone who otherwise was not going to have a voice, who otherwise was not going to have anybody speak for him, and did so against great odds, I mean, indeed, in the face of some error. So that certainly qualifies as a hero in my I've often recalled the most, in my mind, impactful scene in that movie, which is the trial is over, Tom Robinson has been convicted, the courtroom has emptied out except for the balcony, because this is a time of segregation. And so the black community members have to be in the balcony, and they're remaining. And Atticus turns around from his table to walk out, and his daughter is up in the balcony, and the reverend there says, Stand up, Miss Jean Louise, your father is passing. Just recognizing his commitment to justice, his commitment to Tom Robinson, his commitment to that particular community in that moment. I thought of that as having your attic extension home. And what a privilege that, that would be. So again, lending your voice to others when they don't have a chance to speak, when they don't have the power that you have. That's an essential role and obligation and responsibility of being an attorney. And I'll close by returning for the We Free Men and quoting from Granny Aiken. This was Tiffany's grandmother. Again, she's inheriting her witch powers from her grandmother, Granny Aiken. So this is Granny Aiken. Them as can do has to do for them as can't. And someone has to speak up for them as has no voices. That someone is now all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Martin. It's now my pleasure to introduce the president of this year's Student Bar Association, Riley Noble. Most importantly, we had no idea that our legal education would look different 
than anybody else has had before. We began law school with the intense fear of being cold called by Professor Duray, mm -hmm. not knowing that we would be the very last one on class that our beloved Durays would see through to graduation. The faces that we quickly became familiar with in our first semester were soon covered by masks. We sat in our first year trial practicum discussing some virus that was popping up around the globe, and we went home for spring break thinking we would just be online for two weeks, not knowing two years later that virus would largely have defined our law school experience. Together, we tackled the typical law school challenges. We applied for summer jobs, we stressed over final exams, all while the world outside continued on, for better or for worse. We watched as our streets were flooded with protests after the death of George Floyd. We experienced the heartache of losing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we celebrated the election of the first female vice president. We saw protests at our nation's capital and the appointment of the first black female Supreme Court justice. Whether we know it or not, these historical events influenced our law school's experience. We learned about principles of law all while the law was developing right outside in the world around us. Despite all of that chaos and all of that beauty, you all continued to thrive. We joined and became leaders of student organizations. We worked hard on notes for the law review and the journal, and we wrote the dreaded paper for our advanced writing credits. Whether it was competition teams, internships, or clinic, we can all point to one opportunity that taught us the most during law school or one accomplishment that we are the most proud of. Outside the classroom, our lives continued on as well. Many of you got engaged, got married. Some had babies, and others watched their kids grow up. Others became proud aunts, or uncles, or maybe just our parents. It is truly incredible to look back on how much has happened in these past three years. Now, I would be remiss if I did not mention the emotional turmoil that this experience has also brought to those who love us most. They watched us from the very beginning as we studied for the LSAT and stressed over our law school applications. They celebrated with us at every milestone, and they cried with us at the most stressful times. I know for a fact that I couldn't have made, this, made it through this without the love and support and sacrifices of my family. To family members and loved ones present, and to those only with us in spirit, thank you. While our paths have all looked a little different, we are united in the challenges that law school has brought us. And today, we are united in our pride for this accomplishment. Our class experience is truly one for the books. We've learned from the best and survived some of the worst. With the guidance of our faculty and staff, with the support of our loved ones, and by leaning on one another, we have endured. What all of this has taught us is that there is light at the end of the tunnel. No challenge is too great, and no weight is too heavy. If we put our minds to something, we can and we will achieve it. But we can't do it without the help and support of others. We learned that this education <clears throat> gives us the ability to make a difference, one decision for one client at a time. It may not always be easy, but we will show up anyways. Now, I remember during orientation, a bright-eyed, curly-haired Daily Schneider greeted us all with unmatchable enthusiasm. She welcomed us to the law school, and she gave us her first assignment. She told us, take out your phones and add a reminder. Remind yourself why you came to law school. So on the days when you really think you're not going to make it, or you weren't good enough, you're going to be reminded about why this is all worth it. My reason was to make a difference, to fight for justice, and to be a badass trial attorney like my hero, my dad. Yesterday, I received the last one of those notifications, and I was reminded that all of this work, all of the time and the stress, and all of the emotional turmoil was worth it. As you go out into the world, don't forget how far you've come. Remember the obstacles and the doubt that you've made it through. And remember the pride that you feel today. We've survived the pandemic and law school all at once. And finally today, we are on the other side. Today, as you walk across the stage, you'll get to add two letters to your name. And you can finally say, we did it. Congratulations, class of 2022, you are done.
person that was our window to what the students were going through, helped us get the messages out that we needed to get, get out in this crazy, crazy time. Uh, and I really appreciate all that she's done for, uh, for the students and for the school in general. It's now my pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, the Honorable Jane Kelly. We're really thrilled to have Judge Kelly with us this evening. She is on the Federal Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, which as these new graduates can tell you, is the appellate court for not only Iowa, but also six other Midwestern states. As you can imagine, getting to that position of prominence in the legal world requires impressive credentials. Judge Kelly received her BA degree, summa cum laude, from Duke University, the other Duke White School, and her JD cum laude from Howard Harvard. She then clerked for both Judge Porter of the Federal District Court in South Dakota and Judge Hansen on the Eighth Circuit. With those credentials, she could have done practically anything, but I think it's indicative of her character that she chose to become a federal public defender in Cedar Rapids, where she served for about 10 years, becoming the supervising attorney for that office in 1999. She was appointed to the Ninth Eighth Circuit by President Barack Obama in 2013. Please join me in welcoming Judge Jane Kelly. But 
but what I think you need to understand and appreciate is the contribution you made to your own education. You need to give yourselves credit for the last three years and how successful they turned out to be. Built into your education is flexibility, adaptability, creativity, and I tell you, those characteristics are going to serve you very well as you start on your careers as lawyers. Law school's hard, but as I was thinking about your class, I was envisioning you and thinking of you as the Ginger Rogers of law school graduating classes, where you did everything we did, Fred Astaire did, but you did it backwards and in high heels. And if you don't know who Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire are, then consider this a shout out to all the parents and the grandparents who know exactly what I'm talking about. You chose very well coming to Drake University for your law school. Once again, your law school has been uh, recognized nationally for its practical education, sending young lawyers out into practice with that kind of practical experience. And by all accounts, you have a group, as a group have taken advantage of all the doctrinal classes as well as those practical experiences, even though it was a really difficult time to try to do that. But your education in the practice of law really has only begun in some ways. <laughs> Thus far, much of your education has been about the adversarial process, the adversarial nature of the profession. And of course, our, our legal system in the United States is uh, famously known as the adversarial system. And uh, I dare say you've probably read what maybe hundreds of appellate court decisions, um, all that are the, the, the culmination of a case that the parties themselves were not able to resolve, and the court had to come in and do it. But being a lawyer is so much more than rating opinions. Now, some of those opinions are quite good, mind you, but it's so much more than that. You do need to know the law. There's no question about that. But even though the legal system is adversarial, not everything you do will be adversarial. Now, I would love to see each and every one of you in front of the Eighth Circuit arguing a case for the panel that I've been. There's no question. But the fact of the matter is that much of what you do as a lawyer is really not about argument. A lot of what you'll be doing as a practicing lawyer in whatever you do is counseling. You'll be working with your with your clients to either work through their proposed course of action or inaction, maybe try to get them out of a pickle, or just negotiating with the other side in the hopes that you can reach a result that both of you can live with. Now that was true where I practiced, uh, even in the federal defender system. And if I could just Sorry about that, this 90 degree weather. On the heels of what, 30 degree weather, I'm sort of, my whole body is adjusting to a bit warmer. So even where I practiced at the Federal Defender's Office, where the stakes were always high, and the stakes were always high on both sides of the case, because both sides were dealing with some of the most important and compelling issues, really, that a community can address. On the one side, the crime and the impact that that has on a community. And on the other side, an individual member of that community, someone who, depending upon the outcome of the case, could be removed from their home, their family, and their society for a number of years. Now, there were, of course, clients who straight out of the gate, or pick and 12. And you know, there are trial attorneys, they get into this job because they want to go to trial, they want to be in court. But they will tell you, no trial is going to happen, no effective trial is going to happen before a whole lot of other lawyering goes on first. The bulk of your time in working on these cases is going to be investigating facts, researching the law, 
educating your client and working outside of the courtroom for the best possible result. You've been trained to read carefully, to think analytically, and to express yourself clearly. And those are the traits that you're going to be using day in and day out as a lawyer inside of the courtroom and out. You will all be going on different paths, uh, different career paths, different professional paths, but whichever one you choose, remember, it's not a race. Be careful and deliberate in those decisions that you make, the big and the small, while of course still leaving that space, that space available for spontaneity when opportunity comes in front of you. Is the type of law you practice first may not be the type of law you practice last, but keep this in mind. And unless you enjoy what you're doing, unless you believe that what you're doing is good work, you're not going to convince anyone else of it. So the best way to be a good advocate is to believe in the work that you're doing, and that is the best way that you can represent your clients. Now, as a lawyer, the path I took was not a path that was followed by many of my classmates. I liked it from the start, but even then, when I started out as an assistant federal public, public defender, I thought, eh, I'll, I'll give it five years, see what happens. Well, five years went by pretty quickly, um, and I still really liked it. And I was still really learning as a lawyer and I really still found the work rewarding. And I can remember a time early on in my career, I went to a college friend's wedding. And sometime after the dinner, one of my classmates, plus ones, back in the day we just called them dates, but plus one comes around to sit, to, to sit next to me. And the first thing, the first thing that he says to me is, so you're a public defender. I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And the next thing he said to me was, how do you sleep at night? Well, I can honestly say I don't remember the answer that I gave him, but the question itself stuck with me. And it was a question that forced me to reflect on why I chose the type of work that I did. And the reason I chose that work is because I liked it. And I felt that when I was going to work each day, I was using my law degree and spending my professional life in an area that I thought was worthwhile. So I stayed. And I stayed for almost 20 years. So that eventually, when, it, when clients would periodically ask me, shortly after I got appointed to represent them. So, do you think I should hire a real lawyer? I could kind of smile to myself. So whatever you do, feel like a real lawyer when you do it. Now with that said, I, I, I do think that we can all agree that our profession sometimes, occasionally, has had some image problems. And maybe some of it's earned, but I think maybe also some of it is the result of just not really understanding what we as lawyers do, what role we actually play in the justice system. And so I encourage you as you go out into your practice, as you become a practicing lawyer in whatever area that might be, be engaged in civics education. That can be a formal type of education, the courthouse with judges and other lawyers. It can be in a high school or a junior high. Or frankly, it can be informal among your friends and family to help people understand really what lawyers do and the important role that they play. So I agree that there is noise a little bit of noise behind our profession, but despite it, I strongly believe that the profession you are entering is an admirable one. 
and in my view, the most effective antidote to misperceptions about lawyers, about any kind of skepticism about is our is our judicial system really fair? That antidote is you. Yep, you. No pressure. <laughs> but you are the face of the legal profession. Many will tell you how important it is that you maintain your credibility and your integrity as a lawyer. It's hard to earn, but easy to lose. Those people are absolutely right. But maintaining your credibility and your integrity are important not just for your own personal career. In my view, it's vital as well to the reputation and sustainability of our profession. As lawyers, you're officers of the court, and you are the face of the legal system. So don't miss out on opportunities that you have individually, collectively, together to engender trust in our profession. Disagree, but don't be disagreeable. Fight for your client. That's not really an excuse to be belligerent. And treat your coworkers, your colleagues, the opposing counsel with respect. Even if, I'd say especially if, they don't do the same in return. Because the bar for decency should never be lowered to the level of the person who's not willing to put the time and energy into it. To the best of your ability, be tolerant, empathetic, and let people see you as a lawyer who's hardworking, diligent and sincere. And I believe that if you conduct yourselves with dignity, then what the public will see is a dignified profession. Now, of course, you are entering the profession in a time when world events, and frankly, events and circumstances in our own country demand our attention, and a lot of it, and in many ways, rightfully so. Difficult times remind us that all is not well, unfortunately, at least not yet. Sometimes I think it can be hard to sort of filter out some of that less than civil discourse, that kind of buzzing in the ears, that cacophony of, of voices about issues that are otherwise extremely important to all of us. Human rights here and abroad, access to education like the one that you've learned here today, to health care, the importance of safe homes and safe streets, lasting peace, the strength of our democracy. And some days I have to say it does feel like rhetoric takes up all the oxygen in the room. But I'm optimistic, I really am, and sure there's a whole lot more to be done on our way, on our road to a, to a better, more inclusive world. There's no question about that. But I do believe we are moving in the right direction. Some might say not quite fast enough and fair enough, that's probably true. But when I learn about the humanitarian projects that you have a class, have taken on both locally here in Iowa and overseas in response to aggressions abroad. I'm encouraged. You haven't been standing on the sidelines. You haven't just been running in place. You've been trained to be analytical thinkers, but you're doers, and that is impressive. In the end, I am confident that when you see something that stands in the way of equal opportunity, an obstacle to equal access to justice, that you're not just going to say something, you're actually going to do something. Law school was stressful. Practice of law can be stressful. It can be hard. Remember to look out for each other just as you have over these last three unpredictable
unpredictable, challenging years. Your mental health and your physical health both are extremely important. Take care of them. Think about it as that little line at the bottom of your resume, you know, where you put your interests. Make sure you've always got something that you could put genuinely in that portion of your resume, even long after that resume is no longer necessary in your professional life. But also keep in mind that the practice of law can be so much fun. It's interesting, it's rewarding, and you get to do good things. And even if you do get a little overwhelmed at some point during your practice, remember how you feel today, which I think, I hope, is excitement, some joy, and some pride in what you've accomplished. And these folks who have been here to support you, they're here today, they too need a, a, a shout out for standing by you during this time. Or maybe I should just say they've uh, put up with you until you got to this day. Um, keep them close. Well, ready or not, you are now a Drake Law School graduate. You are going to have some very attractive options, lots of places that you could go and lots of things that you could do and lots of places where you could do them. Choose well. Be generous with your time and your expertise with those who need it. Now, where are you going to go? You've got a lot of options there as well. But I'm going to put a plug in for Iowa. You already know it's a great place to study law, but it's also been a talented and, and supported bar. You're going to get to know lawyers all across the state, and they're going to keep you honest because you're going to see them again and again. It's a big enough state where you're going to get really interesting work, but not so big that you're going to get lost in the crowd. So as a transplant who's established pretty deep roots here, I can say that I'm really glad that I chose it. Again, my deep felt congratulations to each and every one of you. I know how hard you worked to be here today to earn this degree. Continue to be both courageous and compassionate. We need lawyers, and frankly, we need fellow citizens who are both. And whatever kind of lawyer you decide to be, be a good one. Congratulations.
and I admit you to all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities there to, in token whereof you will receive your diploma and academic credit. Members of the graduating class of 2022 will now be seated. Congratulations. Then you may be seated. Now, will those who have just been awarded degrees please rise by row, beginning with the front row, and proceed as directed by our Marshal, Caitlin Downs.
Jackson, Thomas, Dow.
Logan Elizabeth Damani. Robert Michael Nelson. Tansy Caitlin Nielsen. Riley Noble. Miguel Jay Spencer Ward. 
Zoe Sunny Whistler. Fallen students received the Master of Jurisprudence. You get the J. Michael Andreski. Macy Coppers. Elise Nikolic. Elizabeth Roberts. Chelsea Stanford. Catherine Renee Town. Please join me in congratulating the graduates of the class of 2022. Executive Director of Catholic Charities, a graduate of Drake Law School, and the Vice President of the Law School's Board of Counselors, which is our alumni group that uh, gives advice to the law school and support. Barbara? Thank you so much, but how do you follow that, graduates? How do you follow that? I don't know. What a great pleasure. And what an honor to be here with you this evening, uh, with our graduates, with your family and friends, with our law school faculty members, and all who are joining us this evening. What a momentous night, for sure. Congratulations again. This is a special occasion, and as you've heard, uh, certainly a significant milestone in your lives and the lives of your families as well and those that you're going to be taking care of in your legal careers. Do take time, though, at this moment to celebrate, to reflect, and to thank all who contributed to your success in completion of your academic studies. It's no small feat. Your dedication, your persistence are recognized and have been recognized this evening. I can assure you that the rigor and the discipline that you have demonstrated in the past few years has prepared you for your future professional career. In the midst of the pandemic, your commitment and diligence are testament to your presence here this evening. We admire your tenacity and your resilience and extend our best wishes to you as you study for the bar exam and then seek a career that best suits your legal and professional interests. On behalf of the great Law School Board of Counselors, we invite you as new alum 
of a law school to stay connected with members of the great community. In the more than 50 years since I began my undergraduate studies at Drake and throughout law school, I can attest to the valuable assistance and guidance that was extended to me by Drake professors and by Drake staff. It is with pleasure we express our warm congratulations to you this evening, to all of you, and we look forward to hearing from you as you embark on a new journey in a new direction. Congratulations again. Thank you. crazy journey, uh, your law school journey, and, and it has certainly uh, been incumbent upon the faculty and the staff to shift gears quickly and, and, and do what was necessary to make sure that you got a quality legal education. But today I want to especially thank you, uh, because we could not have survived and we could not have thrived without your help. And as you've heard, and I will reiterate, you have shown patience, flexibility, resilience, and grace in the face of this difficult disruption. And you made a success, and those qualities you exhibited will make you better lawyers. When your deal craters or your witness doesn't show up at trial, you will know how to handle it because you have handled the twists and turns of your legal career. And I just want to say that I'm very proud of all of you, and I know that um, you're going to do great things. As you transition from being a law student to being an actual attorney, I'd like you to reflect one last time on the mission of Drake Law School. You see it hanging up in the law school in various places, including in the dean's office, so I see it every day. It says that Drake Law School prepares graduates to promote justice, serve their communities, and uphold the ideals of ethics and professionalism. So just consider that for a second. You're now prepared to promote justice, to look around you at the world and find places where you can make a difference, to make the world more fair and more equitable. We have prepared you to serve your community, and I guarantee you that every single one of you is now equipped to become involved in whatever place you land and make it a better place. And finally, we have taught you to uphold the ideals of ethics and professionalism. What we've tried to teach you is not only what the law is, but what it means to be a professional. We know that you will not only be lawyers who do well, but also lawyers who do good. You all have what it takes, and let me say on behalf of all the faculty and staff at Drake Law, we're in your corner, and we can't wait to see what you do for our very best wishes that you continue your journey. We'll now close with the singing of the Drake Alma Mater. Please join us in singing the Alma Mater, which can be found in the back of your program. And at the conclusion of the Alma Mater, the platform party, faculty, and members of the graduating class will leave the hall. Members of the audience are asked to remain standing. 